All right. So before the break, we were seeing that Amos in chapter seven starts describing a vision which God has given him. In the vision, God is standing on a wall and God is holding a plumb line and God holds the plumb line against the wall and God sees that the wall is crooked. The wall is not completely straight. It is a slightly sloping away. You know, so, um, and the Lord says that uh, the nation in the same way is crooked and so he's not going to allow them it's not going to spare them any longer. Uh, that would be in verse 8. So the Lord says, Look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. And so as a result in verse 9, the Lord says, I will destroy the sanctuaries of Israel. You know, that's basically the temples, the all this golden calf temple and all the other uh, idol worship temples which have been established. The Lord says, I will destroy all those, he says in verse 9, all the high places of Isaac, I will destroy, he says. And the Lord also says, with my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. And um, so, when Amos is giving these prophecies, um, Amaziah, who is like the high priest, he's one of the main priests in Bethel, he is very, very angry with the words which Amos is speaking against them. And so he sends a complaint to Jeroboam II, who is sitting on the throne. He sends a message to him saying, you know what Amos is prophesying? Amos is saying that God is going to kill you by the sword. It says in verse 10 and 11. Uh, so he instigates the king against Amos. And the king is very angry. And then, um, in maybe we can read out verses, verse 12 and 13. This is what Amaziah says. to. First of all, Amaziah stirs up the king against him. And then Amaziah, this is what Amaziah says to Amos, uh, verses 12 and 13 in chapter 7. Chapter 7, verses 12. Then Amaziah said to Amos, go your... Go, you see, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread and their prophecy. But never again prophecy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. Okay, so Amaziah is saying, first of all, why did you come over here? You belong to the southern kingdom. You go back over there, you earn your livelihood over there. This is what he says. He says, go back to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Why are you coming over here? You know, you're not even wanted over here. So which is when Amos speaks those words and he says, I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. I was just a shepherd. I was looking after my orchard. God told me to come and speak this judgment against you. That's the reason why I have come over here. And then this is what Amos says to Amaziah. Um, these are the words of judgment which he speaks to him. Very, very strong words. Um, that would be verses 16 and 17. Yeah, 16 and 17, if someone could read out. Um, now, therefore, yeah. hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not spot against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus say the Lord, your wife shall be a halos in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by a survey line. You shall die in a def defiled land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. Okay, so this is the words of judgment which Amos speaks. He says, You have spoken against me. Uh, you have tried to stop my ministry by giving a complaint to Jeroboam the second. You have done all that, but this is what the Lord says, and very shocking words. In verse 16, he says, your wife will become a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters, they will fall by the sword. And as for you yourself, he says, you yourself will die in a pagan country. And so, so you know, um, what did he mean when he spoke such strong words? Uh, when we look at Amos chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, we will see the kind of lifestyle which these people were living in Bethel. 
Um, so if someone could read out that first, uh, Amos chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. That in the day I punish Israel for their transgression, I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altars shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of uh, ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. Now, this is the kind of lifestyle which these rich leaders, spiritual leaders, political leaders of Bethel were living. They had winter houses and summer houses. You know, we, we earn our entire life to buy one house. And these people, they had multiple houses. So in summertime, they'll go and stay, you know, in, in a higher level in, in, in a, uh, you know, summer house. Then it, when it becomes cold in the winter season, they'll come down and, you know, stay in another house. So they had multiple houses and their houses had ivory, you know, on the inside, decorated with ivory. I mean, they were living such expensive lives. And this is what the Lord says, when the judgment comes upon you, when the Assyrians come and attack, I will tear down the winter houses along with the summer houses. And he says, I will destroy the mansions. You know, they will all be demolished. So poverty will strike the people. So imagine what would have happened to Amaziah's family. Amaziah would be in a very wealthy position. His wife would be in a very honorable position. But once the Assyrians come and attack, he will be taken away as a slave. He will, be, he will die in some pagan country. It is said that his sons and daughters will fall by the sword. So now what happens? The wife is left. She has no money. She has no uh, support because her children are dead. Her husband has been taken away and she would be forced into prostitution. So those are the kind of uh, judgments that God speaks against Amaziah and his family. And in fact, against the entire you know, people of northern Israel. So... Um, Hosea was mainly used to give a last message of hope. Amos, on the other hand, was used to talk about the very terrible things which will happen if the people do not shape up. So God used these two prophets to express both judgment and compassion and give a final chance. Assyria had become very powerful by this time. Uh, so all the surrounding nations were really very, very afraid of what's going to happen next. And in a time like this, God is still saying, I can protect you. I can change things if you choose to respond. But the people had become so hard in their hearts that the seeds which were falling, it didn't even penetrate. On the other hand, if they had dug that hard soil, if they had started responding, then there could have been a great change. God would have stopped Assyria. God would have defeated the Assyrian king. Miracles would have happened for them. But the people did not choose to listen to Hosea or to Amos. Okay. Um, so now we will look at Joel because you know Joel was uh, is addressed to the southern uh, kingdom, to, to the southern kingdom of Jerusalem. So coming to the book of Joel, um, it basically has only three chapters. So chapter one talks about a plague of locusts which will come upon the land. And then chapters two and three, uh, God says, you know, uh, if you repent and return to me, I can stop this plague of locusts. Uh, so um, maybe we could look at chapter two. 2 verses 12 and 13. So if someone could read out Joel chapter 2, 12 and 13. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. So at this point of time, this was the difference between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom outright idolatry. I mean, uh, 
they will go and worship the golden calf they will worship the canaanite gods uh, they are, they don't even pretend to be holy here on the in the southern kingdom the people uh, they are more hypocritical they'll pretend to be very very holy uh, they'll pretend to be doing all the correct things so you know they will have these ceremonies of deep mourning and fasting they will tear their robes and say oh lord we are crying out to you for justice and mercy but inside their heart this only dirt this only sin so the lord in fact says to them over here rend your heart and not your garments i'm not interested in torn garments i'm more interested in your torn heart are you willing to tear your heart and say lord i am ashamed of what i have been doing and i want to change so you stop tearing your garments that's just outward show are you willing to tear your heart and say i am going to rip out all the wrong that is there inside so god says if you are willing to do that i can stop this plague of locusts which is supposed to come upon you now the word locust is just another word for grasshopper so you have different types of grasshoppers especially there in the middle eastern region they had a wide variety of grasshoppers and so um over here god is speaking metaphorically is not talking about an actual bunch of grasshoppers is talking about uh, he's he's talking about a huge army which will come like a huge swarm of locusts um now if you were to look at that verses which talk about the locusts there are four kinds of locusts mentioned in that particular passage um so joel chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 if someone could read out and count the number of types of locusts which are mentioned so i'll ask you the question after the after we read out those two verses how many types of locusts are being described over there over there what are the names given to them okay so joel chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 tell your children about it let your children tell their children and their children another generation what the chewing locust left swarming locust has eaten what the swarming locust left the crawling locust has eaten and what the crawling locust left the consuming locust has eaten okay so this is a prophecy that they should tell their children and those children should tell their children and in that way may to the future generations so here this prophecy is not just a prophecy of judgment for one generation this is going to be a judgment which is going to come in step by step over a series of generations and the locusts which are being talked about over here they are going to be different kingdoms which will come and attack so the first locust which is described is the devouring locust okay so different versions will have different wording um some will call it the chewing locust some will call it the devouring locust that's basically the locust which will eat up everything that is green you know so even if this one leaf left on the tree it will eat up that leaf so everything that is green they will come and eat so in those days there were a farming community their economy depended upon agriculture they didn't have industries and all the other things which we have today so imagine if you have a bunch of locusts coming and attacking the land their entire economy would be destroyed there would be no uh, food left there would be no grains to sell it will affect them financially in a big way so locusts were considered a very very dangerous threat and so god uses the example of locusts to talk about the judgment which will come and he talks about a specific kind of locust he talks about the chewing locust which will chew up everything it will devour everything in sight it will not leave anything and uh, so generally it is said that this probably refers to the babylonians who come and attack uh, you know the southern kingdom so they chew up the temple they chew up the city the walls of the city are broken so they basically chew everything there is in sight nothing is left okay so this is the this is the first kind of judgment which will come upon them after that you have the second kind of locust which is being mentioned 
the word used over there is swarming you know most of the english translations will use that word s w a r m that just basically talks about a whole bunch of um of uh, locusts which are together and you you know when you have a whole bunch of locusts together it's called a swarm of locusts that's the english term that is used just like you have a bee uh, bees of the beehive when all the bees come out of the beehive and you have a huge swarm of bees it almost looks like a small cloud and if you were to go to youtube and if you were to type out the words swarming locusts they would literally show you you'll see a cloud in the sky moving a black cloud moving in the sky only thing it's not a cloud it's hundreds of grasshoppers all flying together it looks like a dark cloud so in those days if you saw a black cloud coming towards your town everyone would start crying out and say locusts are coming and they're going to destroy our fields because once the locusts land in your field they will wipe out every bit of vegetation nothing will be left so swarming locusts were dangerous they would come like a large cloud and it's very interesting if when you look at the youtube videos um uh, i mean uh, they they show a person who's standing in the middle of a cloud of locusts and is taking with his camera is literally surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of you know locusts so uh, those are your swarming locusts and so after the babylonian invasion the next kingdom which comes and attacks those would be the medes and the persians uh, they call them the medo persians uh, so uh, the the king who married uh, esther he is a persian so the they were called swarming locusts because it's like a thick cloud you know they literally cover uh, the entire land you can't see the daylight once you have this huge you know you have millions of locusts coming and they uh, they cover your the sky over your area it becomes dark you can you can almost cannot see the sunlight so um, that is the kind of picture being used over here uh, for the medes and the persians because they covered almost the entire uh, world the known world you know which they used to call the people in those days were not aware of some of the continents uh, but they were aware of asia and europe and all of that so um, they covered almost the entire area medo persians right from egypt all the way up to pakistan that entire region was covered by the medo persians as though you know by a swarm of locusts so um, that is the second judgment which would come upon the land of israel the third kind of locust which is described in some bibles they will call it the young locust in some bibles they will call it the crawling locust because i think in the first two months or something the locust they cannot fly they had the, their wings would not have developed so they only crawl along the ground and again you know you have youtube videos of this where they where the entire ground is covered with them it looks like a moving carpet you can literally see it moving because you know they're all crawling 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 and going and you can uh, see the see it, uh, see every bit of ground covered by them now this they uh, the commentaries compare it to the greek empire which will come and the greek empire they will be able to get into every sphere of life like this uh, crawling locust even the smallest gap they'll get into the gap they will not leave even one bit of ground uncovered the greeks were like that because you see they were the ones who um, were making advances in science they were the ones who were bringing up new cultural practices their language became so popular that everyone began to speak in the greek language they were able to spread into every area of society so they were like the uh crawling locusts and then you have the next kingdom being mentioned which would be the destroying locusts which are the romans the romans were a military power they were very very powerful so they destroyed uh, many of the places which they conquered uh so so the lord is telling tell your children about this tell your children's children about this that this is the kind of judgment which will come upon you but at any point of time if you choose to become faithful 
if you choose to give up your evil ways i can stop it i can stop the locust attack but if you do not come to me and repent all these four levels of judgment will take place so tell this to your children maybe they'll be willing to listen maybe they will they will be willing to repent okay so that's the message which joel wanted to convey to the people um so we are told that most probably he would have written his prophecies during the time of ezra nehemiah after the people have come back to the land from exile so now in this new time when the people have come back from exile it's a chance for them to start a new life to not go back to their old ways so joel is commissioned at this time to talk to the people and tell them that you know if they can live a new and different way of life then uh, you know the uh, the babylonian invasion has taken place but all these other things will not happen to them god can protect them and shield them from the future attacks so um, joel speaks probably at this point of time that is when his prophecy maybe was given um he also uses other images not just the locusts um he also describes the attack of the enemy like a lion which is attacking um maybe verse uh, in chapter 1 verse 6 if you could read out for a nation has come up against my land strong and without number his teeth are the teeth of a lion and he has the fangs of a fierce lion yeah so this is another image which is used uh when you see a pack of lions attacking a wild buffalo or something you know uh, you have this national geographic videos where you have uh, you know a pack of lions they go and attack the buffalo and they bring it down and then you know they show you um, they show you uh, they show the animals feeding on that poor buffalo and then after at the, at the end of the video when you see what what is left all you have the ribs of the buffalo and maybe the you know the legs the hoofs that's it every bit of meat is like gone so here you know the enemy is being described that it, it has teeth like the teeth of a lion and the fangs of a lioness they will tear apart the prey until nothing is left till only the you know bones are left so um, so that kind of imagery is used uh, in this particular verse to describe the enemy so god used a whole different types of object lessons and pictures and images and all that to talk to his people but the hearts of this people had become hard they had not plowed the la- the ground and made it soft so that same thing can happen to us you know we can listen to sermons every single day we can uh, go to meetings all the time we can read christian books about uh, you know uh, the teachings of the bible but if the ground is hard the seeds will not be able to bring out the crop so we need to make the so- or the heart of uh, the soil of our hearts soft by digging and removing the stones and the ob- other obstacles which are lying over there in the ground uh, so uh, joel talks about these judgments which will come upon them and then he also goes on to talk about uh, future restoration which god will bring so joel he's he's the one who you know prophesies about this very popular thing that we're all familiar with uh, so maybe we could have someone read out how god will one day restore the people joel chapter 2 verses 28 and 29 Joel 2 28 and 29 and it shall come to pass afterward that i will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and also on my men servants and on my maid servants i will pour out my spirit in those days so the lord speaks judgment but he also starts talking about the new things which he will do in the future so we know right joel chapter 2 these verses 28 and 29 they were fulfilled uh in the book of acts when the holy spirit is given to the people so the lord says i will pour out my spirit on all people not just the people of israel but all people so that everyone will you know start living according to the spirit 
so the restoration which joel talked about has already started from the time of the book of acts we see the work of the holy spirit taking place in the world um in the book of john god talks about how once the holy spirit comes he will convict the world of sin righteousness and judgment so all that is already happening there are people from different countries coming to the lord there are people accepting salvation from you know different people groups so the work of restoration has already started and it will continue till the end times so there are some interesting prophecies given in the book of joel regarding this um maybe we could have someone read out for us joel chapter 3 verses 9 to 11 joel 3 9 to 11 proclaim this among the nations prepare for war wake up the mighty men let all the men of war draw near let them come up beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears let the weak say i am strong assemble and come all your nations and gather together all around cause your mighty ones to go down there o lord now uh, when you are reading joel chapter 3 verses 9 to 11 what exactly do you observe over here in verse 10 how is this verse different from what we generally hear in sermons is chap is verse 10 saying something which sounds different from what we generally hear where it says beat your plowshares into swords beat your pruning hooks into spears what do we generally hear anyone online anyone wants to um touch upon this in what way is what joel saying over here different from what we generally hear or have you never heard at all anything about plowshares and pruning hooks and i have any of you ever heard any sermons at all about plowshares and swords and pruning hooks no you've not come across sermons like that um okay let's look at isaiah chapter 2 if someone can read out for us verses 3 4 and 5 isaiah chapter 2 3 4 and 5 many people shall come and say come and let us go up the mountain of the lord to the house of the god of jacob he will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths for out of zion shall go forth the law and the word of the lord from jerusalem he shall judge between the nation and rebuke many people they shall beat their sword into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation shall not lift up sword against nation there neither shall they learn for any more o house of jacob come and let us walk in the light of the lord what is the difference between the joel passage which we read okay i mean most of the students are like fast asleep so wake up your brain and you know try to uh, figure out this puzzle what is the difference between joel and the isaiah passage uh, joel passage was joel 3 verse 9 to 11 Isaiah passage is Isaiah chapter 2 verses 3 to 5 uh, anyone who's alert can you point out the difference between the Joel passage and the Isaiah passage what does it say regarding the plow shares and the spears and the pruning hooks exactly like um akil akil who's wide awake and paying attention says that you have the reverse being mentioned usually in our sermons we talk about how a day will come when the lord will say take all your you know swords and other military equipment and turn it into agricultural implements because war is not going to be there anymore there'll be peace so you will not even need any military equipment anymore so take all your military equipment and turn it into agricultural implements turn it into plowshares so that you can you know dig the ground turn it into pruning hooks which you can use for cultivation that is the passage the isaiah passage which is generally preached about how a day will come when war and violence will cease you know just like sanjay pointed out over here in the online class uh, so war will be removed peace will be established and then you can have agriculture happening in peaceful environment 
But in Joel, you have the exact opposite being mentioned. In the Joel passage, God is crying out and saying, all of you warriors, rouse yourself, get up, let's come, let's fight, is what the Lord says. And over there, the exact opposite is being instructed. The Lord says, take all your agricultural implements and turn it into military weapons because war is coming and you will have to fight. Okay, so hopefully at least some of you are awake now. There's a contrast. Joel is talking about one, one time period. Isaiah is talking about a different time period. So what is being spoken about over here? In the Joel passage, most probably it's referring to the final war. When all the nations, you know, they, they want to turn against God and they want to fight against him. So it's probably talking about the battle of Armageddon. When God will say, all of you want to rebel against me, all of you want to fight against me, fine, come. You know, convert all your agricultural implements into weapons, come, come and fight. So the Lord says, so there are, there's two, you know, in, in the Ijoel passage, it says, come and gives one instruction. In the Isaiah passage also, it says, come and it gives a different instruction. So in the Joel passage, the Lord is speaking to the nations and he says in Joel 3 verse 11, come quickly, all you nations from every side and assemble, bring down your warriors because God says, I'm ready. You want to fight with me? Let's fight. And you know, uh, the Lord is saying, I will win the battle. So that is your Joel passage where God is saying, come, you know, bring your weapons, let us fight. On the other hand, the Isaiah passage takes place after the battle of Armageddon. War is now finished. God has established himself as righteous victor. He is on the throne. The millennium rule of Christ is going to begin. It's going to be a time of peace. And now at that time, you're not going to be needing any military weapons anymore because the battle is now over. So now over here in Isaiah passage, when the Lord says, come, he doesn't say come for war. He says uh, in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 3, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to worship. And again there's a, there's a come in verse 5 where the Lord says come descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So now the darkness is removed, the war is over, the Lord has established his throne and now there is going to be only light. So you have a contrast between the Joel passage and the Isaiah passage because Joel is talking about that final war between good and evil, between the Lord and all these rebellious nations. And Isaiah is talking about the time of peace which will come after the battle of Armageddon. Okay, so um, these, uh, so Joel is the one who talks about this and he also makes another promise. In Joel chapter 3, verse 18, we have something else which is mentioned. If someone can read out for us, Joel 3, verse 18. And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water of the valley of Acacias. It says a fountain will flow out of the Lord's house. Now, what does this remind us of? Which book of the Bible talks about that? Which talks about, uh, you know, uh, prosperity. And then it talks about a fountain which is flowing from the uh, Lord's house. Um, anyone online? Does it remind us of any other Bible passages? Sister Revelation. Exactly. You know, so in uh, Revelation, you basically have, uh, you know, a life-giving river flowing out from the Lord's presence. So here in Joel chapter 3, verse 18, is talking about how one day all of creation will be renewed. The earth will be restored into a new kind of Eden. In the very beginning in, in the book of Genesis, you had a perfect garden of Eden. But then after that, the fall happens, sin enters the world. But then in the end, there will once again be a new Eden established. Uh, so uh, these are the um, positive prophecies that are given at the very end you know, at, 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 of the book of Joel. So here in the book of Joel, 
it is a lesson that is being given to the people who have come back from exile now they can have a new chapter a new beginning in their lives if they wish to and the lord is giving them you know this kind of encouragement and telling them i can stop the judgments i can give you a different kind of a life if you choose to repent and he says stop doing an outward show stop tearing your uh, garments instead be willing to tear your heart be willing to completely repent and change your ways okay so um these are the things which are promised in the uh, book of joel so um unless you have any questions we can actually uh, conclude so next class we will have uh, okay after um, joel and amos we'll have obadiah okay so next week we will have obadiah onwards so anyone has any questions no all right so we'll close with a word of prayer then lord we just thank you so much for the things that we could learn today help us a lot to be people who are very very careful to sow seeds of righteousness into the soil of our hearts on a regular basis we pray oh lord that we will not become overconfident when things are going well we will not stop fearing you and honoring you but rather we will be people who will continue to do what is good we will continue to sow righteousness into our lives so that when the time of harvest comes we will reap uh, the fruit of righteousness we will reap unfailing love of the lord we will reap blessings so we pray oh lord that we will be willing to tear our hearts and not just put on outward shows of holiness so that lord uh, you can bless us and you can build our lives lord we see in these in these books of the old testament that the israelite people refused to listen to your voice and so they suffered but lord we who are living in the new testament times help us to have a very different response unlike those people we pray oh lord that we would be willing to respond and when we respond we pray oh lord that you would shower us with your blessings and you would bring us into complete peace thank you oh lord in jesus name amen